We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Going Off Track podcast. Um, that was the Singapore Grand Prix, and that was kind of one of the most exciting races we've seen all season. I think we've said that a few times before. It's my favorite. But it's, my it's, favorite. it's, I mean, favorite. I know it's your favorite, it's but it favorite. was like, it was really good. It was really, really, really exciting, especially on a track that's so hard to overtake on. Yeah, d- like taking the results out of the picture it was just super exciting to watch I think I texted you or not text you dm'd you like ah anxiety stress a hundred times throughout the race because I was watching it and I was like okay there has to be only like 10 laps left and we weren't even halfway through the race it was just there was so much like act kind of action but not because it's so hard to overtake but there was just so much going on it felt like I don't know it was super exciting I loved watching it it was great. Yeah, it was it was it was really cool. You you were DMing me just like ah and screaming and stressing and like I'm pacing. Um I just like because I have my statistician's background, I still just like, you know, my leg will shake and that's kind of my only body bodily reaction to these like really exciting race nope. type moments or just sport type moments. So I'm just like sitting at my desk and I'm just nope. like so much stuff is happening. And I'm, like, walking around and, like, stressing my dog out. And, like, I'm up, I'm down, I'm, like, I'm throwing my phone. I'm, like, laying on the ground. I'm standing up. I'm squatting down. I'm, like, going in circles. It's, uh, that's, that's how I watch sports. So, and, yeah. I haven't had that since... Um, when I was in high school, UCLA basketball was in the Elite Eight um, when Gonzaga um, had Adam Morrison as one of their top players, and he was the guy with the with the porn stash, and nobody really likes him unless you were a Gonzaga fan. Um, and UCLA came back in the last, like, 16 seconds to upset them in the Elite Eight, and I was, like, the most excited I've ever been watching a sporting event. Um, and so this was just like, this is really exciting, but I'm just still sitting here. No, I I do that for every single game. It doesn't matter. Anything. Any sports thing. That's how I watch it. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. If I do that, Bishop just gets very confused and is like, Mother, what are you doing? And of course, today is Bishop's adoption anniversary. I know. Happy, happy gotcha day, Bishop. It's exciting. She says, she says, thank you. And also, Mother, why are you on my couch? (laughs) I know. Winston uh, is locked in his kennel because... He likes to disturb the podcasting, so yeah. he's locked up. Bishop's very but... lucky. She has two couches in this place. Uh, when, I mean, everything that's mine is his because Winston, yeah. it's his world. I'm just living in it. But exactly. during mom's podcast time, he has to go in his kennel. So. Aw, poor baby. <laughs> I know. But anyways, so now that we have our, uh, our animal situations <laughs> updated for everybody... <laughs> Um, let's get into our hot lap recap of the Singapore Grand Prix. So I've been waiting all season <laughs> yes, to you say have. this. Max Verstappen did not win. Nope. His his win streak and Red Bull's win streak has finally come to an end at the hands of none other than Carlos Sainz. Who won probably, like we said, one of the most exciting races this season. Yep, he did. Yeah, he he definitely did. And Carlos and Lando, who are former teammates, kind of teamed up to protect their one-two finish from the attacking Mercedes behind them. Mercedes pitted, got fresh tires, and were really, really fast, had a ton more grip towards the end. Um, And Carlos and Lando kind of teamed up a little bit to to defend their their one-two podium finish. Yes, and George Russell, who was the leading Mercedes in that attack, he clipped the wall and crashed on the final lap of the race and blew his P3, uh, handing it to his teammate, the one and only Lewis Hamilton. I know it pains you to say that, Catherine. I mean, it's um, like, I don't really care, but it's, it's just like, we'll talk about this later, but Lewis is just so sneaky with how he gets points, and I'll leave it at that. Um, but... Taking a few places down the results, um, but still in the points, was Liam Lawson, 
Um, he drove so, so well. He ended up P9, which blew my prediction, which, which again, we'll talk about later, which is fine. But he is making things super complicated at AlphaTari for 2024 um, for their race lineup. We all have been talking about who is going to actually race for AlphaTari next year. They have two seats open. No contracts are signed. So Liam's definitely making things interesting. And it should be noted that he's the only rookie in F1 history to get points in Singapore. So I'd say good on you, Liam. Another great weekend for him. Yeah, he, he is really making a statement with every opportunity he has to be in that car. Yeah. And let's get into the, the weekend because there were a whole lot of other things that were happening. There were, there were, again, my favorite thing to talk about, contracts. Contracts! <laughs> so we did get a con- confirmation. Zhou Guan Yu will be racing for Alfa Romeo in 2024. Um, I know on our prediction podcast, it came out and then like a few hours later, they confirmed it. So just to give you guys an update, if you did not see, he will be driving for Alfa Romeo next year. I think it's really good for the sport. I think it's really exciting. Um, he gets to drive in his home race in China next season. Yeah, I'm really, that's what I'm really hoping for is that China comes back because we haven't had the China race for a really long time with COVID and COVID restrictions. So hoping that he'll finally get to race in his home race. Um, now the only contracts that we don't have signed yet or, you know, seats filled, um, no driverless cars, um, (laughs) Call back to last episode, um, is Alphatari and Williams. So Sergeant seat is still up for grabs a little bit, and the Alphatari both seats in Alphatari are open. So there are th- still three drivers to be confirmed for the twenty twenty four season. Yeah, and three drivers available for just two seats at one team. <laughs> yeah, so it should be interesting for Alphatari. We'll see. Yeah. Um, and then getting into the weekend, my poor Red Bulls, uh, they look terrible all weekend long. Um, it just, it, from, from the jump, they just were having issues. Max, uh, mentioned that there was a braking issue with his car that really impacted him at qualifying. Um, and this is actually the first time since 2018 that there were no Red Bulls in Q3. So that just goes to show you it was not a good weekend for the, uh, championship leading contenders. No, they they really struggled all weekend. Just in every facet of the word, struggled. Yeah. Struggle bus. Yeah, really. I mean, Verstappen did make up a lot during the race. He ended up in P5, which I think is much higher than I would have put him after qualifying. Um with with that track and how hard it is to overtake, and obviously he got lucky and got moved up um, one place because George crashed on, on lap 62 of 62, um, but I still think P5 is just way more than anyone would have expected with the way that they were performing on that track. Yeah, definitely. And it still means that this is one track that Max has never won at. Mm-hmm. We have a whole nother gear. So. We'll see. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, and then moving into Quali, we had some real scary seconds with Lance Stroll. So, yeah. I, it, depending on what broadcast you were watching or if you were watching the broadcast, you kind of were, like, riding along as it was happening. Yeah, um, that was very abrupt. Which was really, yeah, just kind of out of nowhere and kind of a little scary to, not that we're in the car with him, obviously, but watching it as it happens, because normally with crashes, I feel like we kind of get the replay or they'll slow it down or they show a different angle. But this was, you know, the top of the car view, seeing it go around, seeing his head kind of like be thrown everywhere. Um, it was a little like, you know, heart to the butt moment of, oh my gosh, is he okay? And that car looked terrible. I swear, I mean, I know nothing about any of this you know, where, how far into the car was damaged, but I, it feels like it could have gone one or two more inches and he would have had broken legs. Like the front of the car was so, so damaged. Yeah. I mean, they, they really, they've done a really good job over the years, especially with like Roman Grosjean's, um, crash when he was driving at Haas in 2020. Um, really that, that, that really made a, 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 you know, 
a statement for all Formula One cars of, you know, driver safety and the importance of driver safety and, you know, things like, you know, the halo and all the other things that they do to make sure that the part of the car where the drivers are sitting is as, you know, safe as possible, no matter what, you know, happens to the rest of the car. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, that's really important is like the survival cell is, is what they call it, is that stayed intact. And he was able to get out of the car on his own power. Um, and, you know, he, he, was, he walked himself straight to, to the medical car, um, but it was still not surprising that, you know, he did not race to, you know, I, I, I would have been shocked to see him in a car today. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we both, I think, immediately were like, oh, he's going into concussion protocol. Like, that yep. looks like he has a concussion. And they never came out outright and said, oh, he has a concussion. But they just said he's still feeling the effects from the crash. He will not be racing on um, today. So it came out this morning that he wasn't going to race. And so to take a step back and think, okay, well, when Danny got hurt, Liam Lawson came in and subbed for him. Why was there no sub for Lance Stroll? Well, in order to have a sub, you have to participate in qualifying. So Danny got hurt in one of the free practices. Liam Lawson was able to do to participate in qualifying, and then he could race as well. Lance, this happened in qualifying, so no other driver was able to qualify in that second seat for Aston Martin. So no one was able to sub for Aston Martin. Um, for Lance Stroll, so it was just a withdrawal from the race, and there were only 19 drivers starting in the race. Yeah, and unfortunately for Aston Martin, and we'll talk about how Alonso did a little bit later, but it was not a really a great weekend for them. It wasn't. Not at all. It was not. No, but it was a great weekend for three drivers who ended up on the podium. I know, I'm so excited. Yeah. I, like, almost started crying. I'm not even, like, when I was watching... Okay, so... Carlos signs one. <laughs> he got he yeah. got P one, <laughs> um, and it was like my dream weekend for for my man Carlos. He did so well in free practices, and I was like, Catherine, this is his weekend. He's gonna do really really well. And then he got pole, and I was like, Oh yes, I'm I feel it, I feel it. And then he drove so so well today. Um, he for once, I think Ferrari actually executed a strategy. Well, I don't think that he gave them a choice. Um, and I think that <laughs> I think when you're I think that's fair. when you're in P one and you know you have the the free air in front of you, you really can you know quote dictate the terms of the engagement. Um, and and you especially saw that toward the toward the end of the race, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but like he didn't give especially after the the one pit stop that they took, he didn't give the strategist any opportunity to screw him over. No. Which I think is interesting because they take every opportunity to screw him over. So I'm, I'm really glad that he's like driving at the level where he forces them to play their best hand for him and not necessarily Charles. Because I feel like, you know, you and I talk about this all the time. Charles is like their golden boy, their, you know, favorite child. And Carlos their is kind of just, yeah, and Carlos is just kind of there, even though they say we don't have like a number one driver or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Watch me break my eyeballs when I roll my eyes when they say that. But I feel like Carlos is really, really starting to get into his, like, groove now. Um, I don't know if we'll see another win out of him just because this track was not suited for the Red Bull. The rest of them is a, for the rest of the season is a whole different story. So I feel like this was the best opportunity for a different car to win. I don't know if Carlos will win, but I feel like he could keep ending up on the podium. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. He he's really he's really feeling the car. He's really driving phenomenally. Um, I think that it would be very hard to to stop him, especially if he continues to qualify ahead of Charles. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And then in P two, another Lando, baby Lando. I'm so happy yeah. for Lando. I loved also I just seeing Carlos and Lando kind of like team up against the Mercedes. Um, cars that were approaching behind them. Carlos was like slowing down to give Lando DRS so he could like defend, which 
is like nice for Carlos to help Lando stay in front, but it was also ha- Carlos helping himself <laughs> to stay out Absolutely. And, ma- and making Lando defend, which gives him a larger, you know, gap between him and Lando. Um, but yeah, it was great to to watch them kind of work together again, former teammates and. Um, I don't remember yeah, I who just, it I was, really... if it was Croftier or who it was, but they're like, oh, the bromance is alive in Singapore yeah. tonight. And I was it like, was it really so is. They're back together again. Um, yeah, I just, I love how Carlos's race engineer was like, um, Lando's in DRS range of you, sir. What are what are you doing? And he's like, I'm doing it on purpose. It's okay. And yeah, he's like, like this is really intentional. <laughs> the moment, and I think this was like lap 59 or 60. So we're really coming down toward the end. And you had like the the graphic on on screen of like the battle for first and the battle for second. It's the same four cars. Um, and and Carlos just really was like had it locked down. And you know, a part of me like I loved it, but part of me also kind of wishes that we got to see Lando and Carlos battle because I think that that would have been a really exciting fight to see too um but I'm still really happy with that one to finish and just how they were able to work together to you know fight off the Mercedes who really you know with the virtual safety car that happened later in the race really were able to take an advantage that could have really done something bad for Ferrari's hopes for that win yeah I think they're both like smart enough drivers to the where they realize if they were going to start fighting, that gives the Mercedes on newer tires with better grip a much better opportunity to overtake both of them. So I exactly. think like they both just kind of realized that potentially. Yeah, they did. And then George, he did crash on the final lap of the race in, in sector two, um, which handed Lewis, um, who was just, he was just sitting right behind them waiting, like waiting to pounce. And I think one of the things, and I, I've talked about this before, is that Lewis and Mercedes itself, but but in this case, Lewis really, um, he just is so sneaky with the way he just gets points in races that really doesn't get talked about because you have everyone else who's doing all these other other things and so Lewis is now third in the championship um, yeah when they said that I was like wait what he's third yeah exactly like (sighs) nobody like unless you're you're a Lewis fan and you follow Lewis really closely like nobody really focuses on on that because there's so many other things happening I know yeah well he's lucky that his teammate crashed I guess but yeah George just bothered me all day all day I can't I mean his radio calls provide for like a little bit of entertainment where he's like come on guys I think we should really try and go and win this one it's like no shit Sherlock yeah. you're, gonna, you're gonna you know be in an f1 race and really try and win it like wow thank you groundbreaking there genius yeah. Ugh, At I the can't. end, af- after the race, he was just, he, he, he was so like, he had no idea what happened with that crash. And he, Lando also clipped that wall at this, like at this right before him. Um, but, uh, George was like, I don't know what, what am I an effing rookie? Um, so he was just, he's been so like trying so hard and so hard to win a race. And then it's just not happening for him. Well, he won Brazil last year, didn't he? Well, yeah, but he also had an opportunity to be successful at Monza, too. Remember, he was, you know, forecasted to win. And I'm forecasted he... to win. And it's like, or no, he was forecasted to a podium. For a podium. Yeah, a podium. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, pump but... the legs, buddy. I'm just excited. Yeah, exactly. This is, like, super random, but I'm really excited to watch Lando win his first race. Oh, my God. It's going to be amazing. The yeah. champagne like... shower that will happen from Lando if he wins a race is, like, Move the trophies because they're all going to be broken. Like, it'll yeah. be that Speaking level of excitement. Speaking of champagne, um, Carlos, because Carlos won, and this is Fred Vasseur's first Ferrari win as team principal, he went up to accept the constructor's trophy. And then after the ESPN feed cut off and they were still showing it on F1 TV, Fred Vasseur literally took the bottle and upended Just it into poured. the back of Carlos's race suit and poured it down. It was amazing. They were having so much fun. I just loved it so much. The whole thing. It was great. And like, Lewis was nowhere to be found. And like, Lando and yeah. Fred and, and uh, Carlos are having the time of their lives but yeah I just uh, it's exciting even in like the cool down room it was like Carlos and Lando you know they're friends they were they were just like having a great conversation Lando's post-race 
um, race recap was so entertaining in that cool down room of just like him watching all those clips and highlights and just like, oh, it, it was amazing. Like if, if you want a really quick race recap, just go watch that bit from the cool down room and you'll be set. Yeah. And then, so again, at, on podium, the winner's national anthem plays and then the constructors, wherever they're like from, their national anthem plays. I was almost moved to tears watching Ferrari sing and, the and get national so anthem. excited during the Italian national anthem. I was yeah. like, oh my gosh. And like Carlos is like conducting like at, towards the end and they're all just like waving their Italian and Ferrari flags and like singing with so much passion. And I'm like, finally, it's not, it's not Red it's Bull. Not- <laughs> it's not the Dutch and Austrian national, national anthems. anthems. We have something different. Oh, yeah, it was so that exciting. Was, that was fun. It was a really cool thing to see. Like, all of them were singing in Italian, obviously, but, like, belting at the top of their lungs. And I feel like we don't get that with Red Bull. Like, they're just kind of there, and they're all just, like, standing there like, yes, we have one again. You, you kind of have to, like, wonder what it would have been like for Carlos to have won at Monza um, last, last two weeks ago. The that Tifosi. Been... Oh, my God. <laughs> they yeah. Been... Oh, they would have gone off their rockers. But, um, yeah, it would have been amazing. But still cool. Still cool. Yeah. I don't know. So moving moving on back on down, we got to talk about Alphatari a little bit. Uh, we got to talk about Liam Lawson versus Yuki Sonoda versus Danny Ricardo. And unfortunately, the, the overarching storyline is just how screwed is Yuki for next year? I know. I know. He's not doing it's, too well. We had a DNS in Monza. We, you know, DNF'd in lap one. For he hasn't Singapore. finished a full race since Zandvoort, and that even that was he finished P fifteen, and that was the that was Lawson's first race where he finished two places ahead of him. Um, so it's it's really it has it is not looking good. I remember um, the it, it, it he he was off the track very quickly, and and Bernie Collins was like. Did he really just retire the car from a puncture? Um, and I, I thought that was interesting. But then he came out after the race and, and said that there was co- collision damage because he and Perez came together on that first lap. Um, yeah. and, and he basically said that there was, like, radiator damage and coolant. There was a coolant issue, so he had to retire the car. Yeah. Uh, of course it was Checo's fault. Well, I don't think it was Checo's fault. We actually never said I'm kidding. Like, I'm you kidding. need to. I no, know I, you don't like Checo, but it's not always Checo's fault. No, we did get a replay of it. Cause remember, cause I was talking, I was like, wait, what Red Bull and Alphatari just hit? Cause like it was so so fast oh, yeah, that yeah, they yeah, like right. showed it, but then they didn't actually say who it was. So I was like, wait, was that Max? Was that Checo? Like who hit who? Who is where? Because like I feel like the first two laps were just mayhem. I had no idea where anyone. So was. many things were happening. Yeah, yeah. So much was happening, um, and then it finally like kind of slowed down. And but yeah, it was. Very interesting. This is a very interesting track because you have to, like, really... They really managed it. They didn't just race. They managed the people behind them based on, like, where people would come out pitting. And they wanted to keep it very tight. And Carlos didn't really truly max out the speed on that Ferrari. It was more about, like, managing the people behind him and slowing people up. George kept saying that. Um, Yeah. But well, that was exactly that was Ferrari's track. strategy was yeah, to keep yeah, yeah. everyone bunched together. And if you watched the the data stream, then you would see you had eighteen cars all together, and then Zhou Guan Yu, who had um, he was the first person to pit, and he pit early to gamble on hards. And so you see all of the track here, and then you see him all the like way behind. Um, yeah. And yeah, it was it was definitely you know tire management, race management, um, keeping the field together, so it would be really hard to overtake, and that exactly that played into to Ferrari's favor really well yeah. um but back to to Alphatari sorry um, <laughs> I just I just track a little <laughs> I always do that yeah. um, um uh Alphatari's CEO Peter Bayer confirmed that Lawson will race at Suzuka next week that hasn't officially been announced pretty much anywhere else other than one tweet that I saw when I was looking for it so I'm going to assume that that's what's happening here. I think that considering how familiar Lawson is with um, the Suzuka track, because that's where he races in Super Formula in Japan, you have to assume that he's going to be, you know, in that race, no matter how much, you know, no matter how recovered Daniel is. Yeah, no, and and that's what everyone's been saying. Like, if he races in Singapore, he'll keep racing in Suzuka, just because he knows the track super well. 
they pull about the same G's in Super Formula as F1, so it's not a track where he isn't, you know, used to or comfortable driving it. Um, it wouldn't make sense to to pull him out now um, and just rush Daniel's recovery if he's Ex- not playing Exactly. There. Yeah, so. plus, I mean... And it's no not like he's rookie. doing bad. He got points. Yeah, no rookies ever scored points at Singapore. Like, that's... That's huge, and yeah. and Lawson Lawson really made a statement today. Um, what do you think, Emily? Is is how is Lawson's performance? Is this bad for Daniel, or is this bad for Yuki? Well, I'm gonna throw a curveball mm-hmm. and give my my unsolicited opinion here. Oh um, yeah, yeah, it's not <laughs> happening. It's not happening. It's not bad for Daniel. It's not bad for Yuki. It's actually bad for Checo. <laughs> That's what I'm gonna say because. I mean, Checo seat, I know it's, like, fine and whatever, but maybe in the future this is bad for Checo, but I really think at some point Daniel will end up driving with Max again for Red Bull. I think it's... Oh, I don't disagree with you on that. I don't disagree at all. I think Lawson driving super, super well will confirm his seat for AlphaTauri. Yuki will become a reserve driver, like the third driver for Red Bull, kind of like Danny was this year. And then we'll just do a switcheroo again in 2025. So Daniel will move to Red Bull. Yuki will come back to AlphaTauri, and then it'll be Lawson and AlphaTauri as well. So yeah, I think I, ultimately I think it's bad for Checo. Logical. Yeah, and I'm I'm not thinking that this is a, a you know I'm not thinking about this impacting Checo for 2024. I I think that he's going to stay at Red Bull. Um, and but in that case, that would be bad for Yuki. But also, I think this it could also be that- bad for Daniel. To be honest. Well, it, it Daniel needs to prove that he can drive the car better and he has to beat Yuki when he comes back um, into the car, assuming that this will be at the Qatar Grand Prix. Um, so that's it. It really all comes down to what is Daniel going to do when he gets back in the car? Because Lawson has already proved that he can drive this car and he can drive it well and score points in it. So then it's really a matter of what can Daniel do with the rest of the time that he has available to him. Well, do you think they would, in any circumstance, be like, hey, Danny, glad you're feeling better. Lawson's killing it. We're going to keep him in the car. Um... I don't think so because I'm not sure how contracts work, but I don't think that they would, if, if they're going to put him in the car, I think, and you know, if he's healthy, I think that he would be their first, their first choice. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, Daniel was their first choice over Lawson um, when DeVries exited AlphaTauri. So I don't think that they'd be like, Hey, we're just going to stick with them. And Daniel still, you know, they, we, you know, we all pretty much know that Daniel being in the AlphaTauri for this this part of the season is to prove that he's good enough to go back to Red Bull. Um, so I don't think that they're going to stick with with Lawson for for the end of the season. It is or something to think about. Season. It's kind of interesting. absolutely, especially if he does super super well at Suzuka because all of these tracks are. It's kind of like the first time he's raced at these tracks. Zandvoort was mm-hmm. the first time he had driven in wets um, in an F one car. So he, it's all very new to him. He did very well in Singapore, you know, first rookie to ever score points in Singapore again. Like, I don't think we can stress enough how big of a deal that is. Yeah. Um, but it is something to consider of if he does super, super well and he's kind of on this, you know, upward trajectory, do they pull him out? Do they throw Danny back in after coming back from, you know, several, several weeks off and an injury? Because that does stuff to you mentally as well of, you know, I don't know. It's just something to consider. It's very interesting. It, no, it, it, it definitely is. I just I think that, that Daniel is still going to get his opportunity to get back in the car because he is also a proven Formula One race winner, um, which is something that uh, Lawson is not yet. Um, but Lawson definitely will be at some point in the future. Okay, so that's kind of everything recapping the race, race weekend, like actual things happening in the race. There were some fun, cool things that happened kind of on track, off track this weekend, we got our weekly reminder that Fernando Alonso is old. Um, <laughs> yes, we so, did. <laughs> which is one of my favorite updates and, and highlights. So he has now surpassed 100,000 kilometers driven in an F1 under, car. Under race conditions. Under race conditions. So that is two times around the equator, I think. I'm not good at math. I think it's two times around the equator. 
Um, but it's something that no other F1 driver has ever done. So it's really exciting. Again, showing the longevity of his career. Um, and our, our weekly reminder that Fernando, Fernando is getting up there in age. God bless him. Yeah. It's, I, I also think it's, it's unfortunate that, like, this milestone happened on a nightmare of a day for, for Aston Martin. Um, they, they showed, like, the, they kind of, like, talked about, like, the side-by-side of, like, because he said, you know, the car, this car is undrivable, which, to be fair, it was, because, like, he kept locking up and couldn't turn, um, which they kind of, you know, threw back to the first couple of races of the season where he's like, oh, my God, this car is a dream to drive. Um, but it looks like that um, Aston Martin really um, – they they're on the back foot with car development compared to you know McLaren to Ferrari um, to even Williams at this point um, that you know it's they're 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 really riding the struggle bus right now and I don't know if we're gonna see the same performances that we saw out of Aston Martin the first half of the season toward this tail end of the year. I know I'm gonna have to start considering that for my podium picks. I've been Me putting too. a lot of faith in Alonso lately, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see. Um, also, it's Esteban Ocon's birthday, and, and I don't think he had, had a very a good one. Day. <laughs> we're, we're, about... we're not we're laughing because of the irony, not that because of he had a terrible race. Um, it's, no, it, uh, he had to he retired on lap forty two with gearbox failure, and that totally sucks. Yeah, that when something like that happens, it's like I really feel for the driver because it's nothing that they did wrong. Like, and it's so yeah. out of their control. And he was like visibly upset. He was yelling at the car and like hitting the steering wheel. He was like, no, 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 no. So yeah, poor. It poor really SD. it reminded me of um, Leclerc's radio call. I was gonna say that um, it sounded just yeah. like Leclerc's radio call. Yeah. From, what? But I what I, I don't know the race. That? Was it Silverstone last year? It may have been Silverstone I, last year. I didn't watch that race for <clears throat> reasons that I don't want to go into. Um, but it it was, I'm pretty sure it was it was Silverstone. Yeah, I think it was. But yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, we'll see. I don't know. We hope his birthday, even though it's not his birthday anymore in Singapore, but I hope he, he you know, has a good travel time on his way to Japan and, you know, maybe has some cake. <laughs> Yeah, but he's not the only one who DNF'd and had a bad day. So if you listen to our prediction podcast, there were six DNFs last year. This year, if you're a betting person and taking the over-under, probably taking the under logically, um, you would be correct. There were only four this year, (laughs) which sounds insane. And it does not count Lance Stroll. No, so if you count, because Lance Stroll was not a DNF, he was a withdrawal. Um, yeah. So we started with 19 to begin with, but Yuki DNF'd in lap one. Esteban Ocon, um, Valtteri Bottas, and George Russell all also um, DNF'd. I think it's funny how, like, Yuki and George be- uh, bookend it. Yuki out in lap one, yeah. George out on the last lap. Horrible times to DNF, never good to DNF in general, but like on the first and last lap, that's a little brutal. So um, yeah, some some other DNFs there for you. But yeah. And then I didn't get to see this, but Will Buxton, who is a journalist presenter. Um, with Formula One TV. With Formula One TV, was giving everybody popsicles because it's so freaking hot. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was so great. I, so I was watching the the post race show, um, and like every time a driver came up, and I think they talked to like five drivers. They talked to a bunch, and the, it, everyone's like, "Do you want an ice lolly?" And I'm just like, "Oh my god!" They're just handing out popsicles, and I, like I think of the drivers who were on the post race show, most of them said yes. And he just like had a little bucket under his little like you know that's table so thing adorable. that they had in front of it. It was it was just so cute, and like obviously like that's exactly. Like, exactly what you're gonna want after driving in those cars like they just everybody looked like drenched in sweat um coming coming out of those cars like I you know it's one of the toughest races um on you know on the calendar for a reason it it's not just because it's hard to overtake but the environment is just so challenging uh they all like go into special training just to get used to the conditions like they're all riding bikes in saunas and heated rooms and with like full gear on and it looks and taking terrible. ice baths and having their social media people filming them taking ice baths like 
so watching many some of the videos. People, oh my gosh, I'm watching some. I don't remember which team it was. I oh, I think McLaren. Whoever did the ice bath, he's like, "Isn't it great? I'm so proud of myself for making this." Like it was so funny. Like they're all trying to, but everybody's team, like I don't know, trainer or whatever, who's doing these ice baths for him, was like trying to one up the others. And yeah, know, it's funny. And Carlos always has the rubber duckies in his, and it's it was really. Really cool to see. Yeah. The video from Mercedes with um, George and Lewis was really great because you've oh got my George God. who's just like, oh, and my it just God, depicts this is their amazing. personalities. So and then Lewis much. is just sitting, like, dude, I'm trying to find my Zen right now. Can you just shut up? It but it's very much like them. So like George is like, hey buddy, what are we doing? Hey guy, hey, 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 hey. He reminds me of um the dog from Up sometimes, where it's oh, just yeah. like he just kind of like pops in and he's like, Hey, hey, what's going on? What are we talking about? He's just like kind of there always. And Lewis is like, take a beat. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Yeah. We're, I, we're good. Not, not right now. <laughs> but anyways. it was, it was, it was a delightful bit of, of social media from the Mercedes social media admins. So good job to you. Yeah, it was, it was good. Let us go and take a look back at our race predictions, which were probably about 80% incorrect. Yeah, I think we swung and missed a lot of these so the podium was carlos lando lewis we all had or we all you and i both had carlos in p3 yeah and then um yeah that's all we got there but we we correctly put him on the podium we did not put him in the correct place yes but you correctly predicted that carlos would um get pulled i did I did. I called Carlos for pole. And I should have known, too, like, if Carlos got pole. Well, but see, I was expecting Max to qualify better. Yeah. So that's why I didn't pick him to win, and that's why I picked him for P3. But, yeah. So I I knew it. I knew he was going to do well. And he wasn't the last driver across the line in qualifying either, which made it, like, super scary. And oh, yeah. And it was just a stress ball of anxiety all weekend for him. Um, but especially during quali. Uh, but, yeah, so Carlos got pole. So I did pick that one right for P10. I think we, we also challenge ourselves because we do all these recordings before the practice sessions. So we, do. we don't have an opportunity to see what people are going to be. So like I knew that our, you know, our podium and our poll picks are probably, you know, my podium, my poll pick um, was not going to be anywhere near accurate, but we recorded those on Wednesday and qualifying Oh is baby, on Saturday. after after free practice two, I was like, all right, here we go. I was like, we are coming in hot. And then it was free practice three, and I was like, yep, sold. We're getting pole. Done. Yeah. I did not watch free practice three because free practice three was at two thirty in the morning, and I like sleeping. Uh, this is a hard one. Um, so P ten. This is uh, my personal favorite one to pick, and I think this is the one that we are absolute trash at. Yes. Um, it's very hard. So I picked Liam Lawson. He was P9, so I wasn't far off. But for a second race in a row, we have picked someone for P10 that has not actually started the race. Yes. So yeah, I picked, not, to I make, Lance. not to make light of Lance's, you know, withdrawal from his injury, but I'm just making fun of us and how we're really bad at picking. So I apologize to... Yuki and Lance, for us picking you guys, maybe it's us. Um, Sorry. Maybe maybe we are the problem. Um, surprise of the week. Ugh, I was really upset. I said no safety car. There was a one yeah, real safety car and one virtual safety car, so that was thrown out the window. Um, and then, Catherine, you picked Alpine to be a surprise and kind of really bounce back from the mediocre performance at Monza. SD did have that gearbox retirement, but Gasly did finish sixth, which is, again, going to my Pierre Gasly theory, could not have told you that he actually got points. I had no idea where he was. And maybe, again, it's not, it's because he's, like, not my number one driver I follow, but I just feel like he, I just always forget where Gasly is, poor guy. Yeah. Well, after, Uh, after Max um, passed him toward the end of the race, I also forgot where Gasly was, you know, on the track and that he was still on the track and, and let alone in the points. Um, I, you know, I, I kind of feel bad because it's like, you know, you, you, it's hard to forget about a driver. Like we know that like Sky Sports forgets about Botas on purpose. Um, but, you know, I feel like that's, a, it's a whole other story. But then Gasly just keeps surprising us and all of a sudden it's like, wait, Gasly did what? <laughs> 
Gatsby finished six? Where? Who? Yeah. In what car? That's surprising. I know. Yeah. Very uh, forgettable. Yeah. And right. then in our who's going to do a dumb, I said that, you know, Ferrari is really going to flub the rain strategy. Obviously, there was no rain. Um, and then also, Carlos, like I said, did not give Ferrari strategy the opportunity to screw themselves up. Um, they, you know, they, they were quite masterful because Carlos didn't let them do what they would usually do. Yep. And then I had Mercedes let's Red Bull run away with the constructors after talking a big game. Oops. Um, I'm eating my sock. Um, Mercedes had a really good showing. They, you know, their big talk was definitely backed up with a good performance, except for George crashing on the last lap. Um, but Mercedes did look good this weekend. So, and Red Bull... Checo got no points and no, he did. He finished finished eighth. Checo finished eighth. Yeah. Why did I think he got like thirteenth? Um. It's because I have a personal vendetta against him. Not a personal one. I just have a vendetta period against Checo. You just you 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 forget that he exists as well. Um, no, it it was it was um it was not the the finish that Red Bull expected, but it was still a double points finish. Um, because yeah, he, they they did have both both drivers in in the points. Oh my god, for, I must have been like was. drunk at nine o'clock in this morning because I swear I was like, oh, Max got fifth and Checo didn't get points. Like ha 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 ha. What was it? Oh, my gosh. And I've looked at the results like. Multiple, multiple times. I don't know how I missed that. Probably because it's Checo. Um, yeah, it, like I said. Um, so up next um, is the Japanese Grand Prix in Suzuka next week. The um, race that we won't stop talking about. The that race that we, we haven't, haven't shut done. up about <laughs> since it's we It's finally like, here. Like, legitimately since we've started this podcast we have talked about the Japanese Grand Prix um and so we will continue to talk about the Japanese Grand Prix and our feelings about the Japanese Grand Prix and especially you know what happened last season um yes. so buckle up for that because this girl has some opinions um about things that happened last year um and Emily and has agreed to give her up to a four minute soapbox to talk about it uh, so. thanks friend <laughs> you you're welcome. Five minutes track limits. Four minutes. You're on target. You're doing great. Good. Great, great. Thanks. <laughs> thanks. I appreciate that. You're welcome. You're welcome. No, because I missed the Japanese Grand Prix last year, so you, you are more than welcome. It, yes. Well, I wouldn't say slept through it. It was like three o'clock in the morning, and it's yeah, not I a mean, convenient time for me. Well, well, not only was it not a convenient time for you, but it was also delayed over an hour because of the weather. So it was an even worse time of day for you. Yeah, because it was supposed to start at two, and then it didn't actually end up starting till three. And those are like after my, three. My prime sleeping times. So yeah, there's a difference between like either staying up through the race and just being miserable the entire next day or like going to sleep for like two hours and waking up. There's a difference from that than your situation where you have to wake up at like 4.30. Very different. <laughs> yeah. As with last week, I took a nap after the race. Um, I know. And yeah, I mean, I won't be taking a nap after next week's race because next week's race is a night race. So after the race, I'm just going to go to bed. Um, but yeah, it, it is... Uh, we, we love us some time zones, and uh, Suzuka is going to be quite the entertaining race, um, and we're looking forward to it. Yeah, and also we have some exciting news. We're up to 100 followers on Instagram, which is super exciting. <laughs> so um, if you don't already follow us on Instagram, please do so at going off dot track. <laughs> yes. Um. So make sure to follow us on Instagram and we will have our Suzuka or Japanese Grand Prix preview prediction podcast coming out on Thursday. That's it for the podcast. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.